My name is Simon and um, I'm from a company called Ruby Red. Uh, Ruby Red established in 2004 and um, our main, um, uh, my main job is to import wines from all over the world into, into uh, Shanghai and uh, including New Zealand wines where I lived in New Zealand for 15 years from 1990 to 2005. So we carry about five, five oh, sorry, I lost count, probably about 10 different brands from New Zealand from Waiheke all the way down to Central Otago, pretty much one in every, one in, one in every region or sometimes two in the region. Okay. So today, um, um, I've got, uh, we had a couple of meetings with NZTs. Um, I um, help NZT, I'm on the uh, Beachhead uh, program where, where we help uh, New Zealand company to, um, to be successful in China. Um, so they told me to do a presentation for, for Wine, wine Marlborough, about once you're in the market, what do you do then? So let me quickly uh, recap on the situation in China at the moment. Before we do that, we have a look. Um, the last 10 years, what we call really the, um, the, the, the market really started in the last 10 years. 2005 was pretty much the first year of the wine market in, for China. This is the graph of import volume from 2005 to 2014. As you can see, it's quite staggering. Where 2005, somewhere down there, and 2014, all the way up there. So why do we say 2005 was the first year for wine in China? Because 2005 was the year where China joined. 2004 was the year where China joined WTO, where they have to lower the tax for a lot of products into China. Import tax for a lot of products to China. Prior to 2005, the import tax for China was somewhere around 89%, so almost 100%. So made wine almost unaffordable for most Chinese households. It would become a really a luxury product. Imagine your, the, the wine was 100% tax, and with the value importers, distributor adds onto it, the wine become very, very expensive. Now 2005, this changed. The tax went from 89 or 90% down to 48.8%, uh, which is today. And for New Zealand wine, we even enjoy a better benefits from our free uh, trade agreement. Our wine sits at 32%. Okay? So it's not 100% tax free, it's, we just reduce the import tax, which is 14% down to zero, right? But we still have to pay consumption tax and as well as um, VAT which adds to about 32%. Now, so we split the last 10 years into really three stages. The first stage we look at from 2005 to 2008, what we call the emergence stage, where wine is very, very new. So the company back then, it's all foreign companies established in China. Chinese companies haven't caught on to the, 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 the wine business. So it's all foreign companies setting up shop in China, in, importing wines from all over the world. The consumers were very much those who returned from uh, overseas, the Chinese, Chinese uh, students or Chinese um, um, uh, 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 employees returning from overseas, carrying them the habit of drinking wines from overseas. Or the foreign expat, at the time there was a large number of expats um, set up in China, or a lot of headquarters being set up in China. So bought in large number of expats um, for the market where their uh, consumption behavior was the key from 2005 to 2008. Now actually, we're going back one slide, you can see the growth actually relatively interesting because from 2005 <coughs> to 2006, you see like 100%, more than 100% growth there from import stats. But does that mean that consumers are drinking twice as much wine or is there twice as much consumer drinking wine? Absolutely not. It just doesn't happen overnight from one year. Uh, you ha have 100% increase in consumption. That doesn't happen. So what happens here, this is the import stats. So what happens, a large number of companies started in 2005, they imported a lot of wines in 2006. So this is the import stats, not the consumption stats, okay? Now here, it's mostly foreign companies selling wines to mostly five-star hotels. In fact, the only on-trade premises you can drink imported wines were five-star hotels. Very, very few independent restaurants serving imported wines almost no Chinese restaurants serving imported wines, and supermarkets didn't sell imported wines, or very, very few. So where the consumption really based in uh, five-star hotels. But 2006, things start to change. 
from 2005 to 2008, we see the emergence state where consumers start to get introduction of wine and where TV programs, the American um, programs start to flood into China around this area. A lot of people start to watch American soap operas and they say, oh, the glamorous young American people finish work, have a glass of wine. Oh, there's maybe there's something we want to do. And look around, a lot of uh, returning Chinese and a lot of expats were drinking wine. So kind of put a, like a picture, wine is glamorous into their head around these areas. So we're going back, and then 2009, it's a very interesting um, phenomenon. 2009, what we call, from 2009 to 2011, is the hype. Because of the foreign companies, because of the uh, returning um, Chinese started drinking wine, a lot of Chinese companies thought there's an opportunity. Wine it seems glamorous. Wine seems something they want to do. Um, being in mind, in those areas, the economy in China is just flying. The stock market went from 2,000 points to 6,000, or 1,800 points to 6,000 points. The property market value went up tenfold. We think Auckland is expensive. Think Shanghai. Went up tenfold, literally went up tenfold. And a lot of people made a lot of money. So in conversion, they wanted to be an industry that's glamorous. So this is wine. Now, a lot of Chinese companies came on board in 2009. So this is where the Chinese companies started to look at wine as an alternative to their business. So you can see the growth from 2009 to 2010. It's incredible, right? It's incredible, right? Does that mean we're drinking almost twice as much wine over, overnight in one year? Absolutely not. That was not the case. This is a flood of wine coming in and it's a hype. From 2009 to 11, it's a hype where a lot of business people started drinking wine. A lot of wealthy business people started drinking wine. So what they want was the best they could afford. So the likes of Chateau Lafayette, likes of the great growth from Bordeaux um, was the key at those areas. I remember those days. We, were, we couldn't get enough of likes of Chateau Lafayette, Chateau Mouton. We could have sold at any price. As long as we had the product, we could have sold at any price. Just give you an example. When we started selling wines in China, Chateau Lafitte in 2006, 2007 was 2,000 RMB, so 400 New Zealand dollars a bottle. At the peak of the hype in 2011, it went to 12,000 RMB. So what is that? In uh, 2,500 New Zealand dollars for a bottle of Chateau Lafitte. Went up sixfold in price in the space of three years. Why? Because everybody wanted those brands to elevate their status. It's the trend, it's what is popular, it is what gives them face, okay? The hype kind of stopped in 2012 because as you know, China is a, um, we're going back, look at the hype, it stopped in 2012. All of a sudden the growth went backwards. Why? Because China is a very political country. You have to understand, China is a country still quite political, okay? So when we have 2000, end of 2012, we have a new change in government. Where Xi Jinping come into power and he said, enough is enough. So he went through and cut corruption. He went through and cut, um, cut um, government spending on a luxurious product. Uh, he went through and basically said there's no more gift giving. So if you're a business based on gift giving, you probably have to close up shop. Um, where you can see the consumption of state-owned enterprise, which is a big chunk of the economy, uh, the government, local government, went from hype to nil, overnight. The tap is being switched off. So as you can see, the, the import stats basically uh, from 2012 to 2013 basically dropped, and from 13 to 14 basically, uh, basically there's no change, stable, because of the change in the, in the government policy. Okay. Is, it a, is it a bad thing? No, I think it's actually a good thing. Stop the hype, otherwise it's just gone crazy. We could have gone somewhere around there and it's just crazy. You know, it's not healthy. So today, from 2012 in 2015, we're looking at back down to earth, it's realization, we turn into a real market. So here's the current situation. For many New Zealand winery we talk to, that's what they're telling us. We have found the importer into China in the last few years. And the importer most likely uh, importer have some connection in New Zealand, whether they studied here, 
Um, they might have lived here for a period of time for whatever reason. They might have some business here or they might just love to visit. In a lot of cases, one is not their main business. They might be very successful in uh, real estate, might be very successful in chemical manufacturing or whatever. Wine is something, it's their side portfolio, or they want to do something with wine. And they all claim to have a very, very good connection. They all claim they know, you know, they know the connection, they can sell the product and they promise you they can do all this and all that. So a lot of the company we talk to have this current situation. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you haven't heard the story, then maybe you're one of the exceptions. So what to do? So as a, as a producer, what do we do? We have, we have imported into the market. The volume may or may not be what you expect, or at least the first container went very quickly. You may or may not have the second container, or if we have the second container, it could be a, a, a long way apart, or they're, selling, they're telling you the wine's not to their palate or whatever, lots of different reasons. What can you do? What do we do as a producer? One, one easy way is just to wait. Well, you could do that, you just wait. Because the Chinese market is very, it's an immature market. Um, the consumption is very, very low. There's a, lot, it's a lot of people are trialing the product, but the consumption is very, very low. We'll talk about consumer a little bit later. So if you compare to the US market, the biggest Chinese importer um, today in the market turns over about 1 billion RMB. It's about 1 billion, just a little bit less than 1 billion RMB. And that is not a lot of money. So it's about 200 million New Zealand dollars for the biggest importer in China. And that is relatively small business in international scales, right? I just had a, a visit in, in France, I just came back from France, and um, the, 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 wine, the biggest wine business is a lot bigger than that. And from US, we know some of the importers, not the biggest importers, some of the importers probably in the 2 billion US dollar mark, if not bigger. So compared to that, the Chinese market is relatively small, right? We always think about this 1.3 billion populations. And, oh, this is a huge market. Well, if you look, if you look, if you look at it, it's actually a relatively small market, okay, compared to the well-established market, to the emerging market. So by waiting, you're waiting for the market to develop. You're waiting for the market to be mature and the volume will gradually increase. I mean, we are, New Zealand is 1% of total import into China. It's not bad, 1%, we could do better, but it's 1%. So if the market gets bigger, our 1% will get bigger. To convert a non-wine drinking country to a, a good market in, in, if you start from 2005, in 30 years, I think it's realistic terms for market to become slightly more mature. It took. It took Japan 35 years. The Japan started in the early 70s, right? Um, took, ta took Taiwan 30 years, or 25, 30 years. It started in the late 80s, right? And took US 35, 40 years. It started in the 60s. That's where the wine started in US, in the 60s. And probably UK, I don't know, I don't have the stats, but UK probably didn't start that long ago as a serious wine drinking country. Well, UK have this different, this, it's a different scenario. So as the market grows, um, your export volume will grow. But is that what we can do just by waiting? Of course not, there's other ways you could active, actively participate in the market. So let's look at today, what's happening? The super premium section is growing quite well, but that's dominated by France. As a New Zealand producer, you, we probably think we are at the premium side of the market. Yes, we are kind of premium, but we are not super premium. We are far from super premium. In fact, I don't think there's any winery in New Zealand we can call ourselves super premium. By definition, when we talk about super premium, we're talking about a product selling um, average price more than 200 New Zealand dollars or plus. There's no cap on top of that. So we talk about super premium in that kind of, kind of uh, sector, okay? It's the great growth of Bordeaux. It's the, it's the uh, super premium from um, um, Italy, Spain, um, and US. They are in their league. We're not quite there. We don't really have the super premium section. Now, the value end is growing really, really well too. Because with more and more Chinese consumer coming to the market, I mean, not everybody can afford their section. Their section is dominated by France anyway. So where a lot of the, where the growth is coming from, Chile and Chile is doing extremely well in the market. Extremely well in the market. Spain is doing quite well. 
France, of course, France is a large wine producing country. They have a lot of uh, value end as well. So at the value end, those countries are doing extremely well. Of course, we're not quite there. We, we don't produce value end as a market, right? What we think value, we can't compete with Chile. We import wines uh, from Chile at around 1.2 1 US, 1 US dollars a bottle. Pretty good wine, not bad. Not ex exciting, but not bad. So you can see this is what we call the value end. Okay, from Spain it's one euro. Okay, 1.1 euro, 1.2 euro, and you get pretty decent products. So we are quite, we're kind of in the middle. We're, we're not quite there um, for the super premium. The custom of super premium, we don't, appeal, we don't appeal to them. And the value end, we are really, we can't appeal to them. We're not quite there. So the middle price is quite difficult. Middle price is quite difficult. This is the current situation. So the trends are very similar to the rest of the Asian countries. I put US there because US is uh, it's, it's Pacific Rim, right? So it's kind of developed, the, the way of developing is quite similar. So if you look back, US, Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, pretty much every country started with the premium, with the super premium side of um, the wine market. So you're looking at Japan, Japan single-handedly uh, created likes of Chateau Margo, right? Chateau Margo was the biggest selling brand in Japan back in the 70s and 80s, uh, where Margo was struggling in France in the, in the 70s and 80s. The Japanese took a likes to Chateau Margo and it was the single, single biggest market for them. And, you know, uh, U.S., again, U.S. In back in the 70s was a big importer of um, Premier Grand Cru Classe of Bordeaux and um, a lot of top end Burgundies. U.S. was f fascinated about them. And Taiwan is the same. Taiwan and Hong Kong and uh, Singapore single-handedly produced La Pan as the one, you know, one super premium, um, Singapore and Japan for the matter, of Bordeaux, right? Without Singapore or Japan, La Pan would be just another Pomerol, okay? It will never be the status they have today. So the trends are very similar to the other Asian countries where the market took on the super premium straight away. A, a kind of, the, the, it's the Asian way you know, it's different from New Zealand where if you're doing well, you don't want to show off because you're scared of people telling you, oh, you, you know, you're showing off. You know, in China, many of our clients drive Bentleys, um, you know, uh, Ferraris. We many clients drive Ferraris. I'm, I'm very lucky I get to uh, test drive a few Ferraris in my, <laughs> in my days. Um, you know, it's, it's okay. It's okay to show off. It's okay to go to restaurants and order the most expensive one on the list. It's okay to show that you are successful. We have this tall property syndrome in New Zealand where we don't want to do that. But in Asian countries, it's not the case. In Asian countries, you want to show face. You want to have this status value. You want to tell people, well, I, I did well in whatever business field. So they look for the super premium products. They look for products they can set them aside. Why is Chateau Lafayette so popular? Does actually people went from zero knowledge to appreciating the great growth of Bordeaux? Absolutely not. Because Chateau Lafayette was the first in 1855 classification, it was listed number one, Chateau Lafayette. If you look at 1855 classification of Bordeaux, Lafayette is at the top. So okay, there must be the best wine available, right? So let's go buy Chateau Lafayette at whatever price it takes, okay? Because I want to stand out. So all these countries have similar traits, you know? It's very different, the mentality is different. So what I'm telling you this, you gotta think about the consumer in the country and reflect back. We often do is we push our products. We are the producer. We all, what we do is look for importer, here's our product. But have you thought about looking from the consumer perspective? Does your product fit with, the, with their needs? So these countries all have very similar traits where super premium, then you go into value because the aspiring consumer to see the super premium, see these wealthy people driving Ferrari and drinking Chateau Lafitte. They go, I can't afford a Ferrari, but at least I can buy some Bordeaux from, from, from France, right? So they go out and they buy the product they can afford. It tend not to be the super premium, tend to be the value chain, right? They tend to be the value, they tend to be try to aspire to those, those um, people. So what can we do to increase sales when we're in the market? Now we know where, where the growth is, the super premium and the value end is growing. We say, oh, is this, what, we, what can we do? And we're kind of in the middle. What can we do to increase sales? A lot of things we could do to increase sales. The easiest thing is bring on more importers. 
right? Why not? The more people who sell wine for you, the better. Okay, so you could bring on, you know, one importer sell one container for you every year. Well, we've had five importers, may not have one container every one, but you might add another three, uh, 300, 400 cases every importer, all of a sudden you're up to three containers. Of course, you don't want conflicts, right? So one of the ways to bring out more importers, to divide China by region, we always talk about China as one country. I mean, we stress over and over again, China is a very large country, okay? The very northern part of China, it's, sub, um, what it, Siber it's close to Siberia. In wintertime, it's minus 40 degrees. At the same time, in southern part of China, it's subtropical. It's 26 degrees all year round or 30 degrees all year round. So can you say China is one country? Well, I mean, when we fly to Europe, I, I go to Europe relatively often. Um, so when we fly to Europe, it's a, I think it's a 10, 10 and a half hour flight. Six hours of the 10 hours, we're in China. So we're flying across, the, six, the first six hours, we, we're in China. We're flying six hours, we're still in China. You know, like, oh, we're almost out of China, not quite there yet. Right? It's a big country. It's a big country. So why not div uh, divide the country by regions? This is a classic division. This is a very, very classical division. Divided by the four quadrants. Um, centered by the primary city. So you have the eastern part of China where Shanghai is the primary city. Shanghai is 30 million population, is the primary city of the eastern part of China. Using that as a center, you could do the eastern part of China. Okay? And the northern part of China is centered by Beijing. Beijing is a, a big city, not as big as Shanghai, it's about 25 million um, population. You can use Beijing as a center for northern part of China, northern quadrant. The southern quarter, of course, is Guangzhou. Guangzhou is slightly smaller. It's about 22 million um, population. So it's the southern part of China. You can use Guangzhou as your base to affect the surrounding areas. And of course, you have the western part of China. Uh, today, we use, often use Chengdu as the, um, the, uh, the, the, the city for the center of west. The center is a bit smaller. It only has about 15 million. That's right. So once you divide those divide China crudely into four quadrants. Each quadrant, each quadrant has probably something like, I don't know, a lot of people. Um, you can find distributor importers for each quadrant. So basically, by finding separate importers for each quadrant, you are effectively doubling. You may not uh, quadruple your import because um, the waste is, is by, by, by value, econ economy value and population is not as much as the East, right? So the East is much more uh, powerful in terms of economy and population-wise as well. So just by finding four importers, you might be doubling your volume just by doing that. So think about something very, very simple, okay? Of course, you have to tell the importers, uh, you have to go through many old Chinese importers, and you probably all heard, I want exclusivity. This is what I want because I know a million Chinese government officials. I can sell 2,000 containers in one year. But you have to let them understand exclusivity is not something, well, if you want to do this way, exclusivity is not something you can give. You can maybe give exclusivity in the quadrant they operate. No one company in China, even the biggest wine importing company in China, can, can cover the whole of China. That is not possible. If somebody said to you, I can cover the whole of China, that is not possible. It's physically not possible. Okay. Maybe if you're, if you're Alibaba, <laughs> if you're listed on the uh, stock exchange for the biggest IPO in the world, yeah, maybe. But I don't think any wine company can claim that. Or another way of dividing it, dividing by channel, right? So you say, well, I don't want to travel to Chengdu because it's too difficult, too far away, uh, too hard. I love to travel to Shanghai. So this is the place I want to be. But how do I increase my sales, right? Easy. You could divide by trade. So what you could do is have one importer distributor working one trade, the hospitality, the horical trade, uh, hotel, restaurants, so on and so forth, or have another importer focus on premium retail, another importer works on supermarket, and maybe one more importer is online. By dividing each um, uh, channels and with different um, importers, you're increasing your sales. Simply doing that, you increase your sales. Okay. 
of course, you have to think about it. You don't want to have an online product that's diminishing your value. They're selling discounts. Um, they were discounting your product online, and the restaurant will come back to you and say, hold on a minute there. Um, you're discounting your product online. You want us to list a, list a product on Park Hyatt or Peninsula, and they're not going to do that. So you may need to divide, if, if it's possible, you may need to divide your product range. So you have one product range is dedicated to trade, one product range maybe specifically online, and one specifically supermarket, if you can do that. If you cannot, you might want to think about a varietal, one particular varietal is for a particular channel. I mean, nothing worse than try, I mean, it's difficult, the online, uh, the, the trade is very, very difficult. We have a, a department, you know, we have um, seven people dedicated working with the trade. Um, and it's difficult, you know, you have to work a lot to convince the sommeliers, because sommeliers, they are the gods, you know, they are, you have to bow to them. They are almighty powerful. I mean, you take a lot of effort to get to them and to get them to list a product. And if they turn around and say, wait a minute, your product is selling online for whatever price, and they're going to say, sorry, delist, and don't want to see you ever, ever again, right? You're not going to be back in there, never, probably. Um, so you might want to think about the strategic, your product st strategy, if you want to divide by trade. But it's very, very possible. Many, many, there's a few companies are doing it and doing it quite well. If you don't, if you think about it, the importer, the importer distributor in China is an extension of your sales and marketing, right? It is an extension of your sales and marketing. And how often have you picked up the phone and made a call or how often you send them an email just to update them on things you've been doing? It's they are your partners in the market. You have to think about it. You can leave the importers to do your job. It's your brand. You can leave them to do your job or you can actively participate in their operation to gain more sales. Let's look at things that you could do. That's the basic, okay. First and foremost, have your product information ready, okay? So often we have winery come to us, and not specifically New Zealand, many, many different, they come to us and say, we want to sell our product. Okay, well tell us about your product. Well, our product is the greatest product there is in, in this region. Well, tell us more, what's your story? Well, our product is the greatest product in this region. <coughs> well, what sets you apart? So you need a story. You need to tell the story of your brand. You gotta give, you gotta create an image of your product. What is special about your product? Why should somebody buy your Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc and not the other? Why should I pay the extra $2 that you charge for your Sauvignon Blanc? Or why should I just buy something off the shelf it's two dollars cheaper because your Marlboro, your Sauvignon Blanc. Why should I do that? You got to give a customer a reason to do so, right? Technical data. That's easy. You got to update your import your technical data. You know, give them the tasting notes. Give them the. Um, you are the expert in your wine, in your brand. You know how it's made. You know what it goes through to make your wine. Okay. Tell them what clone do you use for your Pinot Noir. You know, is it is it um, what do we do? We in uh, ten bar ten bar uh, ten bar five. 10 by 5 in popular Marlboro? I don't know. Right? Which clone do you use? Uh, do you have a clonal selection? Um, do I, why do I use this oak barrel I use? Why do I use that? Or oh, my percentage is over 20%? 12 months on lease? Do I use batonage? Why do I do that? How often do you share those information with your importers? The decisions you make makes your wine special. How often do you do that to share those information to your importers? I think not often enough. Well, most wineries, not often enough. From my experience, we work with almost 200 plus wineries. Okay? Um, the wine does really, really well in our portfolio is those producers are quite pushy. Right? They are kind of in my face, yeah, in our staff's face. Right? Okay? They want to tell the story. They have this tremendous um, proud and passion, and they want to share everything. Sometimes we get a little bit too much, <laughs> but it's the way to get your information across. It's the way to get your importers to think about your products all the time. And there's a lot more you can do. This is some of the examples. There's a lot more you can do. You have to treat your importer as an extension of your sales and marketing. And you've got to consistently update your, your importer on the things that you're doing, the new things you're doing, the things you're trialing. You never know because, you know, um, I'll just give you an example. We have an Italian producer, they're in Piemont. 
Um, they've, we've been buying the Baroros all the time, Baroros and Barberescos, and uh, sorry, Baroros and Barbera de Estes and the um, um, Darchetos. It's red wine, they've been doing it all the time. And um, they never presented the, the Moscato Dasti to us, never. And we didn't know, the, first of all, well, we kind of knew they produced the Moscato Dasti. We thought it was like, no, it's a little bit of volume, I didn't really care about it. But it turns out they are very good at it. They're one of the best Moscato Dasti in, in, in their region. So they, you know, through communication, we found out, and they said, well, would you like to take some? We said, oh, yeah, we've been buying Moscato Dasti from a different importer to, to supplement our, um, our portfolio. We didn't know you had made this product. And next thing you know, we sold 500 cases in, the, in, in a space of six months. Just by introducing, because it's slightly fizzante, it's a little bit sweet, and the packaging is absolutely beautiful. And um, they, didn't, they didn't want to push it because they have other market commitments and so on and so forth. But you know, just let us know. We can, you can tell us, oh, we want to have 500 cases. We can do that. We can do that. Just by giving us this new product, they increase their sales straight away. Create a reason for your consumers to push your product. Think about it, whether it's Father's Day, my product is best for Father's Day, Mother's Day, I don't know, create a reason. You know, the flowers, it's, it's snowing today, so my products give them a reason, I don't know. Um, keep your online information up to date. The consumers are very, very smart, tech savvy, okay? Your online information is important. Um, um, their customers will reflect, re re research your website, have a look at the information. Imagine information haven't been updated for 10 years or five years or or whatever. People say, well, well, nothing I can see here. So they move on. Uh, we have to overcome the importer, importer's fear. Um, the importers, a lot of, lot of times you talk to importers, they do not want to share information with you. Okay? They're very protective of their customers. They feel like it's their customer. Your supplier should not touch their customer. You're the supplier. You know, this is our customer. They fear that you are the customer is going to bypass them to come into you direct and they fear you are trying to sell to the customers directly. You have to overcome that. You have to explain to the, your importer, it's all about cooperation, it's all about trust, it's all about you are trying to help them, to help you to sell more products, right? So you have to gain, gain trust um, into the importers to get them to share uh, the marketing strategies, their client needs, and so on and so forth. Get them to tell you the story, and then you can sit down together, try to work out something that works for both, both parties. Sometimes it's about face value. Your importer don't want to tell the bad news. If they didn't sell, they bought a container, they only sold 20%. They go, oh, I promised them like 10 containers in the next five years. My God, I'm struggling to sell the first container. What do I do? How do I tell them? They probably won't tell you. Probably, it's a face value. It's a very Chinese thing. It's a very face value. They say, oh, uh, no, everything's doing very well. Right? You just, we're doing well. We're going to place our order very, very soon. Very soon becoming next year, year after, sometime never. Often they think they know better. They say, what do you know about China? You know, I live here. I know better than you. Uh, so I don't want to listen to you. So all that, it's challenges you have to overcome. You have to overcome those challenges um, sitting down together. I mean, overcome the challenges, one way is just more communication. Um, going in, treat them as your friend, as your extension of your marketing and sales. Treat them more on a person-to-person, uh, -person, um, uh, uh, give them person-to-person -person time, get to know them and then take away the fear they may have um, in those, those uh, circumstances. So, and then together you can do better work together. You gotta create a communication channel, create a very more casual communication channels. Um, the way we do business in New Zealand is very, very different from the way um, business is done in China, right? In China, it's all about making friends first, business later. We're in New Zealand, we're very square, business, business, we don't think about anything else. We sell the products to you, it's your turn. Um, we often don't think about the association comes after selling the products. You know? um, again, I'm trying to say it's an extension of your sales and marketing. So what do you do with your people here? You've got to do the same. Uh, you have to be in touch with the key people in the business. Okay? Um, we did a bit of work consulting some New Zealand wineries. I don't want to say the name. Um, but they are only in touch with the head of the, the company. Okay, so you only get like this grand view of the company, nothing more. Okay, but I told them you, you have to get in touch with the actual the marketing team, the sales team, the sales manager. Um, you have to get in touch with the people actually selling the wines. So they started doing trainings with the people who are selling the wines, the, the actual 
people who uh, they deal with customers, all of a sudden you get all this feedback. You say, oh, we want to do this, but is it possible? I mean, what does this thing mean? I mean, what does this actually mean? Or, all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of questions just come up. Oh, we're trying to do this, but it doesn't really work. Is there any way we can do it? By actually working with the key people in the business, you're discovering a whole new side of the business. The big boss are telling you, oh, everything's fine, I'm doing this, and this is my, my, this is my development, my real estate, and I own a power plant here, and whatever. But he's not there to sell the wine on a daily basis, right? You've got to get past him to get to the key people and to resolve the daily issues and help them resolve the daily issues and give them the tool to sell your wines. Okay? Just by doing that, the sales increase significantly. And understand where and how your wine is being sold. Often it's a black hole. You, sell the, you send the container into China, then what? Did nothing happen. Where does the wine go? You think, oh my God, where's my wine gone? Right? You have to talk to them. Bring down the barrier and talk to them, hey, is it my wine being sold in on trade? Am I being sold, sold online? Or so on and so forth. Once you know where your channel is, you can ha we can sit together and develop a strategy to sell together. You've got to create goals and targets for your importers. Okay? It's very, very important to have a realistic target. Right? If, a, if an importer comes to you, they're going to sell, I'm in the power generation company, I've got tons of money, I want to sell 10 containers of your wine next year, is it realistic? Think about it. Is it realistic? Are you just getting carried away because somebody made you a big promise? Oh my God, I'm going to sell 10 containers. It's very exciting. But think about it. Is it realistic? Let me give you a classic example. Um, I, I uh, do a bit of um, talk for one of the uh, wine education programs up in Beijing. Um, so we did a CEO class. So we, what we did, we went and shared some information with CEO of many wine companies. One of the companies came to, came to me afterwards and said, oh, I have this, real, you know, this problem. You know, we are a um, uh, chemical manufacturing company, state, partly state-owned, and they're very, very big. They're turning over like billions, massive. You know, they have something like 15,000 uh, employees in their company, a huge company. They said, well, one day they decided, well, well let's get some whining because every year we, you know, as a company, we drink like, you know, 10,000 cases of wine. I don't know exactly figures. We should import themselves. You know, we should create a division to import. So, so he was giving charge of this division or being the new division, the wine division. He said, but I actually, I, I'm, my life, I've been spending my life 20 years selling chemical products. So I have to, don't check about wine. So what they did, so it ha just happened they had one of the customers in Italy. So they flew over to Italy. They said, oh, we want to look for some wine. And they went into, um, uh, they found a, 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 a Fontana Fredo. It's a, if you know Fontana Fredo, it's a quite a large company in Italy, um, making, based themselves in Piemonte. They're making um, Barolos and Barbaresco. It's a big company, a very, very good brand. So they went, they went in and they said, oh, we are blah, blah, company. We're starting a new division. We love your wine. I mean, the wine is very, very good. And of course, being Italian, they're great at entertaining, right? They are, they're just superb at entertaining. All of a sudden, they're bringing us wines from the 60s and the 50s, and we're drinking Barolos, you know, aged Barolo from the birth year of this person. And they're, oh, they're just fantastic. So they go, we want to work with you. So they bought three containers of Barolo and Barbera de Asti and so on and so forth, back to China. Based on four days of visit, they signed a contract, being the exclusive importer. Uh, the Italians are pretty good, but, but after two years, they sold less than half a container. Because they're not in this business. The first order was great, right? But they're not in this business. They promise they want to, the yearly growth, it's unrealistic, right? So they came to this, this CEO and said, now we want to get rid of this brand. It's kind of pressure because we kind of have to buy it every year and we can't sell it. What do we do? How do we ditch them? <laughs> they start to realize this is not their business, right? I'm not sure how many of you have this experience. If you have a consumer, if an importer come to you and say, I want to buy 10 containers, but I'm in the um, manufacturing carpet business, and, but I'm changing to the wine business, you've got to think about it, okay? We never turn down opportunity to sell some wine, to make some cash, but you've got to be realistic. Is this a one-off business or is this an ongoing business? You've got to do a bit more homework 
and sit down together, create a goal, okay? Realistic goal. Um, they must have, you must have a common goal. You, you might, whether it's value, volume, or, or percentage growth, it's okay. It doesn't matter. But you have, must have a common goal, a realistic common goal. It's important. You have, you're on the same page. And you've got to create incentive for your importers. We never think about it. We think, well, you're the importers. I'm giving you a good price. You're making profit, right? So here you are. There's a container of wines. You do the job. But have you thought about it? Hey, what, have you, what have you done to incentivize the importer to sell your products? You know, we have 2,500 SQ in our portfolio. Why would your product stand out from the rest of the SKUs, right? So think about a way to make me want to sell your product or make my uh, sales manager want to sell your product. Whether you, know, you have a plan to reach a particular goal, you can send them a trip to New Zealand or you can give them extra cases or give them cash rebates or whatever. It's not important which, how, whichever incentive where you want to look at. But you've got to think of a way to incent, in, in, what's the word? incentivize your importer. It's not enough just giving them a container, get them to get on their jobs, right? It's very, very important. Trip to New Zealand works. It really works. We just, I'm just sending my marketing manager, uh, Emily, to uh, US because uh, we work with a, a company called Jackson Estate. You may or may not have heard of Jackson Estate. They own about 25 different wine, wineries. And we work with them on the premium side of the business. And um, they say, we, we're doing a harvest festival. Send your people in. You know? I'm sure when Emily come back from US, she'll be all gung-ho to sell their product. Why? Because it's the experience she had in US, right? It's the connection she can make. And it, it will be like, it'll be her product. I'm sure of it. She's very excited about it. Not only to incent inc incentivize your importer, think of a way to, to incentive your the end consumer, whether it's a small gift, whether it's a branded item, whether it's you create a competition. You've got to think about it. Why should a consumer buy your product? It's important for you give them an extra little bit of reason for your, for your consumer to buy your product. Right? Think about a way to create that little bit of reason. This could be a joint investment. It should be a joint investment with the investor, with the importer. Your importer should jointly invest in this part of the business. But you also need to show your effort into it. You can't just expect your, in, in, your importer to do everything for you because at the end of the day, the brand is yours. We are the importer. We don't own the brand. We are, effectively, we are just a carrier of your brand. We are the extension of your sales. We just do it on your behalf. So you have to, you know, it's, it's a joint investment. You can't expect the importer to do everything and then they won't do it. You know, we won't do the investment if you don't put in, if you don't, if you don't invest in, the, in, in your brand, why should we? Right? We have 200 brands we have to work with. Why should we invest your brand? Give us a reason. Market visit. Market visit is very, very important, but market visit, you have to be well planned. Visiting the market is no use. You're just turning up on the doorstep. We have often, because of our relaxed frame, we have often have New Zealand wineries turn up in our showroom and say, Hi, Simon, I'm here to see you. I say, um, wait a minute. First of all, I don't know who you are. Uh, we don't have an appointment. I don't have time to see you. I have to be polite to see, see them. But it creates pressure on me if you just turn up and say, here, I want to do something with you. It doesn't work that way. Okay? You have to plan your visit to get maximum usage out of your visit. Because it's expensive. You go up there, the airfare, the accommodation, so on and so forth. It's not cheap, right? So you want to maximize that. And, um, it's not at, and it's no longer the prestigious event 10 years ago. 10 years ago, you know, the consumer falling over themselves to attend a wine dinner because there's a winemaker there. Today, there's probably five wine events on every night in Shanghai. From the prestigious Chateau to the boutique growers of Burgundy um, to the Australians, the Chileans, you know, many companies set up offices there. They can do one thing any day, any time. Right? So if you're there in the market, you've got to prepare for it. Things you have to do. You, you've got to first and foremost, you've got to train your importers and their staff. 
you got to go beyond training the head of the, uh, the import. You got to train the staff. There is so important, I can't stress more. If you haven't been talking to your importer staff, then you, you ought to, you ought to talk to their staff, right? You get a different set of story. And uh, you gotta train them. You gotta give them the tool to sell your product. You gotta create education for the consumer. Consumer are getting very, very clever. Consumer are getting quite advanced, especially in the main centers. When we're going to do a master class, in, you know what we did um, earlier this year? We did a tasting with a Burgundy producer on malolactic fermentation. We presented wines pre-malolactic fermentation, pre, uh, just after fermentation, um, just went into barrel pre-malolactic fermentation, um, post-malolactic fermentation, um, post-bottling, bottling, and uh, aged products. You know, we, are, we can only do it for 20 people because it's difficult to arrange those samples. We could have probably 100 people attended the tasting, the masterclass. People are hungry for information. If you are still on the basic stuff, or oh, this is New Zealand and this is where Marlborough is, you have to prepare a more, a better education notes. Dig deep, right? Marlborough is not just Marlborough. Right? You have Wairau, you have Aotearoa Valley, um, you have the Southern, Southern, Southern Valleys. So you gotta dig deep. So what makes you different? The, the microclimates, the soil, the clones, go deep as deep as you can, and the consumers are quite advanced. So on the same time, you've got to have introductory uh, presentations as well. When you go outside of the main centers, going to secondary, tertiary um, cities, they are probably a little bit behind in terms of wine knowledge, so you've got to present them the normal stuff that you do. But in Shanghai, if you're still presenting, here's Marlborough, you are out. The consumer will just go, well, I know that. Right? Consumers are very advanced already. You know, when we do our tastings, we talk about the individual. I did a tasting just before I came to um, uh, New Zealand. We did a tasting of um, Gervais Champetain, um, Clos Saint-Jacques, right? Clos Saint-Jacques is a 5.4 hectare piece in Gervais Champetain. They only have five producers, only have five producers. We gather all the producers, to gather all the different references together, and uh, we did a tasting of several different vintages, and we got, a lot of people want to sign up because it's different, right? It's very, very different. And people are already into that kind of stuff. It's probably what you are thinking, Chinese consumers are still quite a way down there. Yes, there are a lot of consumers still way down there, but a lot of consumers are very, very advanced. So you've got to give them a reason why they should buy your product. Why, should they, why shouldn't they just go out and grab a bottle of Cloudy Bay because it's the most well-known, right? So why should they buy your Sauvignon Blanc? Key client visits, very important to plan, plan your key, key client's visit. If you're selling to the trade, if you want to visit if you're in Shanghai, the hotels, the top uh, restaurants, you have to make appointment well in advance, a week, sometimes two weeks. The sommeliers are very busy. I'm, I, in the, earlier in the presentation, I told you, the sommeliers are like gods, right? They have, they have French producers coming in, flying them first class to, to Bordeaux, five-star accommodation, tasting great wines, eating the Michelin star restaurant. Can we do that? No, of course not. We can't do that. So they are getting well treated by many, many, but so we have to use our advantage, right? We can't compete in that kind of sense. So we've got to use the advantage. You've got, to, you've got to plan those visits. You can't just turn up at the door. They won't see you. And if they did see you, they'll be very annoyed that you did that. Um, branded events, wine tastings, wine dinners, you have to plan those things. The top clients in China, top, our top clients are very, very busy. If, you know, some of our top clients spend over a million with us every year. And getting to come to one tasting, it's very, very hard. We invite them, fully paid, we send a driver to pick them up. They won't come. If you think I'm putting on a free feast in one of the best restaurants in Shanghai and the consumer will come, no, they don't. The top consumers don't even want to know about it. Because to them, they, can, they dine there every day. It's no difference, right? So you've got to think about them and tell you, we have, to work, we have to work very, very hard to get those top customers to come to our tasting. And they have knowledge. Plan it. You can't just go there and do a dinner, expect people to come. You can't just go there and do a tasting, expect consumers to turn up. It doesn't work that way. You've got to give your importer tools, you've got to give importer information to sell the tasting, sell the events, and to create those things. And you have to create a bond between you and the importer. 
right? And when you're visiting market visit, the, probably the most important to do the events and create this bond between your importer where they can share the information, where you get to know the business, where you get to know the problems they, they're facing and what you can do to resolve their set of problems. Maximizing your time, plan, plan well in advance. Provide examples, right? If you're going to the market to a visit, what is a few bottles of wine? You're already paying the airfare, paying the accommodation. You gotta take some wine. You gotta take the samples and give them the samples, right? I mean, there's no reason you turn up and expecting they providing all, the, all your bottles. Right? You've got to give them the allowance to do so. Right? Provide examples. I mean, it doesn't cost you more and compared to airfare. <laughs> it doesn't cost that much more. And give a reason to convert sales while you market. While you're in the market, it's a great time to drive sales. Whether you want to do a limited bottle, sign the bottles, whether you want to do something a little bit different, whether you want to do some incentive, I don't know, bring some fluffy kiwis. They always work. And new products can work quite often. Right? Sometimes the customer get a little bit tired of products. And sometimes customers say, well, I've tried this over and over again. What can I do new? So sometimes it's good to create new products, single vineyards, um, extra aged, or Sauvignon Blanc. But it's very fashionable to have barrel aged. Um, Sauvignon Blanc, likes of Dog Point, does a very good job. Barrel aged, the section 49, no, sorry, 90, 94, section 94, uh, oak aged. Tecoco sells very, very well in China because people want the, the status, right? Because it's difficult to get. Hard to find. It tells people that you know I'm sophisticated. I'm drinking barrel aged Sauvignon Blanc now, right? So, works. Um, different grapes, different wine making techniques, or, or just you just a limited label. Don't do anything different. Print a different label. Just say, hey, this is limited. This only happened in 2015 because it's the year of the sheep in China. So I'm putting a label that's different for you. Would you like to try some, right? get some commitment out of the volume. Things you could do that doesn't cost you much, right? Create a new label on your existing wine, doesn't cost you that much. But give your importer a new story to tell because it's limited. The wine's no different, but it's limited. And mostly you have to re remember is help to increase sales without lower the price. As an importer, of course, we always bargain <laughs> with you. I don't usually, I don't. Um, I'll leave the job to my purchasing manager. No, just kidding. Um, no, always import always get a better deal, but try to create um, um, businesses where it's not on discounting. Um, we hate to see you not making a profit. Right? We have to make a profit as an importer. You have to make a profit. We hate to see you not making a profit. Um, things like <laughs> limited label, I can just raise that by a dollar because it's a limited label, because I only make this much, so would you like to take it? It gives you extra, a bit of profit, okay? Don't, don't tell the importer Simon says so. <laughs> Um, but don't lower your prices. You know, don't lower your prices. Think of other ways to incent in incentive. We have a problem with this word today. <laughs> incentive your, uh, your, your, your importers. <coughs> lower your prices doesn't, doesn't do it. And once you lower your prices, you never get it back. Just look at UK. Look at the problem we're having with UK, right? right we, New Zealand 7 Blanc become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Apparently, I heard <coughs> £2.99, you can buy a bottle of New Zealand 7 Blanc in UK now. I heard, £2.99, right? I don't know who's selling it, but I think it's some, some sort of private label, some, I don't know, Tesco's or something private label. But by lowering your price, you're gonna go down to this dangerous spiral of not able to get it back. Once you lower the price, we will not let you to get it back. As an importer, once you say, okay, I'm gonna sell it to you at this price, you're gonna stick this price. And if you wanna increase your price, it's difficult. We're gonna, we, we will challenge you, why are you increasing your price? You know, that means we have to change our pricing profit system because you increase the price. You're allowed to lower, but going backwards is very, very hard. We don't let it, we don't allow it. <coughs> so don't do that, okay? Don't lower your price. We talked we talk about over and over again when I was in Oakland Chrysler, we talked about how to gain quick access into the market, uh, cross industry marketing. You go into the market, you don't have any consumers, right? But you know who the consumer is going to be. So why not cross industry? Why not work with people who already have those market, already have those uh, consumers? So for wine, we often work with uh, watch uh, distributors. In fact, it's the other way around. The watch distributor always want to work with us because they always think wine consumers can afford fancy watches. Uh, we just did an event with um, Constantine, a top um, Swiss watch. 
So we invited some of our clients, they invited some of their clients, beneficial, it's mutually beneficial to both parties. And hopefully we can get access to new clients. Um, we always make an example of your ice cream seller. We have a lot of ice cream seller into China. Why not work with a coffee, um, a coffee um, seller? Very similar consumer base. Coffee and ice cream, very, very in China is very, very similar. So you can effectively cross market into that. Okay? So don't feel that you have to gain consumer one at a time. In this day and age, in, uh, information is so readily available, you just have to go out there, work with different people to gain quick access to the market. And it's also a brand association. By working with uh, Constantine, we are lifting our brands to a level, right? Because they are super brands. They're one of the top four brands of watch, Swiss watches. Um, available is 100,000 a piece, right? So by associating yourself with these brands, you are lifting your image, right? I was just talking about it with Lynn just on the way over. We're talking about a classic example of accident happens where a producer of cosmetics apparently associated with Kate, um, um, Prin Prin Princess Kate in UK, apparently. And uh, all of a sudden, the brand just, just flying out of the doors, right? By accident, by association with a very famous person, your marketing is done, right? Try to create that association. Try to create that association in the market. It's not easy. Sometimes accident too happens. But if you, once you've done that, you'll be surprised how well your brand can do. I'll just give you a very quick case study. It's probably towards the end of my um, presentation. Just give you a quick case study. Think outside of Square uh, using technology, cross-marketing, cross-field marketing, and um, um, to promote um, your product and conversion into sales. So this is an example I gave in Auckland Christchurch as well. So um, we, we do more than just wine. Wine's about 75% of our business. It was an important part of our business. But um, we do a little bit of other business as well. So one of the businesses we're involved in is tea. So we are uh, um, manufacturing and selling tea. Now one of the brands we sell is called, English brand is called Maven, Chinese brand is called Mi Shan. So we have, uh, it's tea bag tea, it's tea bag. Uh, we have loose tea and tea bag. This particular product is tea bag. So we know where we, we, where we want to sell the product because it's a, China is big. We don't want to sell to the whole of China because with tea bag teas, there's no point going to the smaller cities because they don't accept tea bag teas. They're more traditional. They want the loose leaf, the traditional Chinese loose leaf teas. So we know where we want to sell the product. It's in the main centers. We want to kick off in Shanghai because it's where we're based. Um, that's where we think the most con consumers are. So our area, targeting geographic area is very simple, Shanghai. We're not trying to tackle China, okay? We're targeting Shanghai, a city of 30 million. Well, it's good, good size, you know? Um, good tea consumption there too. And we know who do we want to target because we, our tea is not super, super premium, but it's, you know, it's, it's not the cheapest on the market. So we don't want to go down to the root of the supermarket, go down to the root of uh, the selling by price. We want to sell by added value. So we know that these consumers will be um, the 25 to 45 year old office, um, office workers. Um, they, have, uh, they like to have a cup of tea, but they don't have the tea making facility. If you've been to China, you know tea making is quite a complicated process. We try to make it easy by putting in a tea bag, uh, premium tea bag, and then they can make a cup of tea very easily just by adding hot water, right? So we know the consumer type we want to target, right? But we don't know where they are. China is a big, uh, Shanghai is a big place. How can we get access to these consumers? Okay, we don't. So what we did is we went to a company that delivery lunchbox to office, offices. So these companies, what they did is they have 10 different catering centers in, in Shanghai. If you've been to Shanghai, you know some of the names like Hua Hai Lu, uh, Lu Jia Zui. Um, Marcus, you, I mean, you've been to Shanghai, right? You know. No, you haven't. Oh, Just, oh you have to. And uh, um, um, Zhongshan Gongyuan. So some of these main key business areas um, in Shanghai, where a lot of the office buildings are, a lot of the, uh, the, the concentration of offices are. And they, they, they deliver lunch boxes into offices. Okay? Um, they do about 6,000 lunch boxes, 6 to 7,000 lunch boxes a day. Okay? And uh, the food is very, very good. And they have a very good rep reputation. So we teamed up with them. So we said, hey, what if we give you 10,000 products? We specifically designed a pack, uh, contain two tea bags and a very beautiful pack um, that allows, allows them to put it into their lunchbox 
and deliver to their consumer. We say, what if we did this to you free of charge? We give you 10,000 TVX. If you split into two days to deliver to the areas that we want to target. So we targeted some of the areas we, we, feel, we felt as have the, the client that we want. And um, they go, oh, great, it's free of charge for them. And they, in turn, use that as a marketing exercise. They say, okay, for the next, for the, this day and this day, if you order our, order our um, lunchbox, we're going to give you a free tea bag. We're going to give you free tea, right? A free afternoon tea. So they use our product as a marketing so, uh, to increase their sales. And we are using their distribution channel to target each individual consumers. So the teas got delivered with the lunchbox uh, in a nice, pretty packaging, two tea bags. But purposely, we didn't put any information in there, right? We want to embrace technology. So all we had was a QR code. It's a brand and QR code. That's all we had. We've already gone beyond websites now. Websites seem so old-fashioned in Shanghai. When we go to designers, nobody talk about websites. Websites last century. We talk about we there, we shop, um, uh, the HR5 formats, all this fancy t terminology I don't understand. But anyway, um, you scan the QR code, takes you to a we shop with all the information about the tea. Was it good for? Um, added value, delivering that extra experience where you can drink it. So we targeted an area we want to target, found the consumer, gave them an experience by sampling the teas, and gave them the information. And then at the end of the page, they could buy it if they liked it. They could, they could buy it, click on it, pay by their mobile phone. We, we buy everything online. I buy 90% of my products online. Buying online, is, it's just easy as that. So they could buy it um, with their mobile phone, make payments, product is delivered um, a day later. We had, a six, we had an almost 7% conversion rate. Of course, we, after we did the exercise, we realized some of the uh, tricks we have to do. Uh, we have to uh, make some changes into our product. It's getting some feedback from consumer as well, because all of a sudden you're getting connection with the end consumer, right? All of a sudden we're getting all these scans coming through. We have their mobile number, we have their WeChat ID, we have all their information. We could target them from then on. Did it cost us? Yes. We gave away free 10,000 packets. Did we make the money back? No, we didn't. Uh, even though we had 7% uh, conversion rate, it's still a marketing exercise. But we have almost 3,000 customers in our database now, overnight, right? And we think, with the future product, we have to you know, create, create uh, experience again. We think we can get the invention back quite quickly. You know? uh, they're doing something this week. Um, I'm not aware of my email has been finicky. My, um, but they're doing something this week, this week. So yeah, so this is something that we use. All that we talked about, find a lo locale, knowing where you want to promote your product, knowing the type of consumer you want to promote to, Finding the right promotional partner who can target the consumer, delivering the experience, the added value, the experience to the consumer, and at the same time, convert that into sales. Embracing technology, convert it into sales. Just a little case study I want to share with you. Um, things like that, you have to think outside of the square when it comes to China. If it was the same as New Zealand, it would not be a problem. You wouldn't listen to me, right? It's different. Okay. So that's my end of my presentation.